So he's, he's telling us a little bit about banking there. But what you don't realize is they don't take all the money and put it in John's house. And then lo and behold, we have to wait till John pays it back till we have some. The government has created this fractional reserve system to create a law that says the banks can fudge the numbers a little bit and we're okay with that. What the bank actually does is it takes 20% and keeps it. They're required by our government to keep 20% in reserve. And what do they do with the rest of it? Well, the rest of it, they loan out. And so someone says, I need to borrow some money. So here's $100 here, and it's on your account. So I'm just going to say you. That's your account. You have $100. But someone else comes in. Let's call this guy Jack. Jack. He comes in, and he wants to borrow money. And the bank says, we've got $80 we can give you. So Jack says, I want $80. And they say, okay, that's cool. But here's the trick. If Jack gets that $80, what's he going to do with it? Is he going to put it in another bank? Is he going to take it out in paper bills? Or is he just going to say, no, just give me a checking account with your bank and uh, put the $80 in that checking account? Often he'll just say, okay, just put the $80 in the checking account. But it doesn't matter because watch what happens. If Jack gets $80... And then he takes it out of the system, and then he puts it back in this bank or any other bank. The total banking economy now equals $180. So he puts $80 into another bank. That bank keeps 20% of it and loans out the rest. And that bank keeps 20% of it, and loans out the rest. And if you do this system all the way to the end, this is actually the way our banking system works, as I understand it. If you put $100 cash into a bank, the bank can, by just writing down numbers over and over and over again, turn it into 500 bucks. That's really the way our system works. So now, you've got $100 in the bank, Jack has $80 in the bank, this next guy has like $60 in the bank, this next guy has like $50 in the bank, and it just keeps on going until the total ends up being $500, all from your $100. So when you go back and you say, I want my $100 back, they give you your $100 back, and when the next person goes back, there's no $100 left. It was all just manufactured fake money. And so now what? Well, that's where the federal government comes in with the central bank, and they say, we're going to guarantee there's going to be enough money for any individual bank. That's what's going on. So let me just draw this down for you. The bank wants two things to happen in your life. Number one, they want you to give your money to them. And number two, the banking system wants you to borrow money from them. Because every time you borrow money from them, they don't actually give you money. They just create an account. And when they create that account, that goes into this virtual banking system. And it actually works like this. The government has two categories of money. One category is called M1. That's called cash um, central bank money. And there's another category of money called commercial bank money. The money you and I deal with when we write a check, when we see our statement in the mail, when we take a credit card, when we do an electronic transaction or a check transaction, anything like that, we are playing with commercial bank money. The central reserve bank is the only real money, the paper money. And guess what? It's 5% of our entire money system. Our entire money system, 95% of our money system is not real government sponsored money. It's bank created numbers. Why am I telling you all this? Why is this important? How does it possibly relate to the Bible? It goes like this, 95% of the money in our economy is debt. Only 5% of the money in our economy is actually money. The other 95% of it is debt that someone had to borrow from a bank so that that bank could create a new account, so that that account could then be treated like money. And we wonder why our financial system is kind of messed up. 
Now, there are all kinds of things that people could say about this, why this system works. The main reason the system works is that it provides a lot, a lot, a lot of money for all of us, and we're really happy with it. It creates a system that can grow exponentially and just get bigger and bigger and bigger. And all of us want to get more money, so we're happy with a system that provides more money. And it all boils down to this simple fact. We are a society that is totally addicted to money, and we want more of it. We feel like just because a year has passed, we're entitled to a cost of living increase. And that's because everyone thinks they're entitled to a cost of living increase. But where does that money come from? It comes from your friends and your neighbors and even yourself taking out more debt so that more numbers can be written down on bank accounts. And it goes like that. And it just keeps on going. So one more thing. I got to make this sort of practical for you and me, how this applies to you and me instead of just our whole system. Here's a graph. Um, Go ahead and take a look at this. The first click shows you the lifestyle at the starting point. Let's assume you get $3,000 when you go to the bank and you, ch- you cash your paycheck. You get $3,000. But you don't really live on $3,000. You spend 1% more. That means on an average month, you're spending just $30 more than you actually make. A lot of us have a tendency to do that. You know, it's just one time going out to dinner. Well, the first month, that's cool, but the second month, now it's not just $30 extra. There's also a payment that you have to make on the previous month's $30. And then you have to figure out how you're going to pay for that. And so this next one, the blue, is the payment that you're going to end up making if you keep this practice going. Over 10 years, your monthly payment is just going to keep going up because you're trying to live a $3,030 lifestyle on $3,000 of money. This is only 1%. It doesn't seem like it's going to make that much of a difference, that big of a deal. And so your payment goes up a little bit, but it's not really insanely crazy. But you have to borrow money to cover the rest of your lifestyle. And then the debt part is the next thing that comes up. Watch how your debt will grow over those same 10 years. Just because you want to live 1% above your means, you end up after 10 years owing the government or the the banks or the credit card companies $15,000. This is what Paul says when when he says that people who love money have pierced themselves with many griefs. Many of us have pierced ourselves with this exact grief. And it's because we loved money. We wanted a little bit more. When I go to Best Buy, I don't say to the guy behind the counter, listen, I'll give you $40 if you let me borrow this computer for a year and then I turn it back. You know, I don't... I don't have that privilege to me, right? But I'm going to borrow the money for that computer and then over the course of the year pay him back that same amount of money plus the $40 or whatever it was. And so I'm going to use the money. Our whole system is based on I want the money, okay? So let's get, let's try to get real practical here. I think we are where we are as a society because we treat money as something inherently valuable, and you have to see what God says about it. So I'm going to race through a bunch of Bible passages here and try to pull it together at the end. Here we go. God has three economic laws in the Bible, three classic economic laws. These are in the Old Testament, and I'm going to share them with you. The first law is this. It's the law of tithing, tithing, and I'm going to show it to you by looking at some verses in the Old Testament that talk about what tithing is and why God makes it a law, okay? So here's your first verse. Deuteronomy 14, 22 says this. Be sure to set aside a tenth of all that your fields produce every year. That means everything you make, all of your income, if you're a farmer, all of your food, if you're a, a, some type of white-collar worker, it's all of your money, but 10% of all of that Be sure to set aside a tenth of all that you produce each year. And then the next verse, Leviticus 27, 30, says this. It says, The tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. And now we know what we're supposed to do with that tithe. The 10% we're supposed to set apart is supposed to go directly to God. And here's this last passage. The Lord said to Aaron in Numbers 18, You will have no inheritance in their land nor will you have any share among them. I am your share and your inheritance among the Israelites. I give to the Levites all the tithes in Israel as their inheritance in return for the work they do while serving at the tent of meeting. In this passage and in other passages, we learn there are two reasons God asks for the tithe. 
One is to provide for the worship that he has in his society. The Levites are the worship leaders and the pastors and the priests. They are the people who are, who are making the worship happen, the corporate worship happen. And the other usage of the tithes was so that the Levites could have enough that they could then care for the poor. And so that the, the Christian or the, the worship system of ancient Israel would be able to care for the poor. So the tithes, God says, here's your first law. 10% of everything right off the top goes to God and his work. Now, you can't do that if you love money because 10% on $3,000 is 300 bucks. And to think about writing a check to a church for $300 every single month, for some of you, freaks you out. How in the world could I survive if I took 10% right off the top? Law number two. God says law number two is individual generosity. Individual generosity. There's some crazy things going on in the Old Testament. Crazy things. Take a look at these, these passages here. Leviticus 25, 35 through 38. If one of your countrymen becomes poor and is unable to support himself among you, help him as you would an alien or a temporary resident so he can continue to live among you. Do not take interest of any kind from him, but fear your God so that your countrymen may continue to live among you. And the next slide there. You must not lend him money at interest or sell him food at a profit. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan and to be your God. If I do profit with another rich person, we're good because they have enough money that they can figure out a way to get profit from me too. But if I take profit from a poor person, I am violating God's command. I'm stealing. I'm using the fact that I have wealth to gain more wealth from someone who doesn't. Interest is the same way. Let's go on to the next one. The Lord will open the heavens, the storehouses of his bounty, to send rain on your land in season and to bless the work of your hands. You will lend to many nations, but will borrow from none. The Lord will make you the head, not the tail. Keep going. If you pay attention to the commands of the Lord your God that I give you this day and carefully follow them, you will always be at the top never at the bottom. Do not turn aside from any of the commands I give you today to the right or to the left, following other gods and serving them. We want to be at the top. And so we borrow more because that makes us feel like we're at the top. But what we're really doing is when we're borrowing more, we're not getting up at the top, we're getting farther down on the bottom. Because the more we borrow, the more we have to give and the bigger they get, the smaller we get. That's why the gap in our society between rich and poor is growing bigger and bigger and bigger because the people down here are borrowing, the people up here are lending at interest and it just keeps going wider and wider. And God says, if you are going to be my people, you're not going to borrow from any 